Anyone who thinks, well, this doesn't apply to me, is not being honest. Prayed before, and I'm going to pray that in this moment, God's going to do something that I've not asked God to do before. And what, what I want to deal with over the next four sessions is this topic that I think is the most relevant topic I've ever had to deal with. It's an issue that every one of us will have to confront tomorrow. Cancel that today. Every one of us will be confronted with this issue. And because of that, this affects young people, older people, it affects marrieds, singles, divorced, separated, single parents, single mums, the lonely and the socially connected. This does not exclude anyone. So anyone who thinks, well, this doesn't apply to me, is not being honest. So would you join me in prayer? Father, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, guide me, lead me. And Lord, I pray for the reception of the truth of your word, that it would grip hearts. And Lord, I am asking you for the first time that as this word is preached, those who are in bondage, those who are in the grip of bitterness, those who are in the grip of resentment, would find that bondage broken in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about forgiveness. And I can't do it all today. I'm going to need four Sundays to do it. And as we look at these four aspects of forgiveness, I'm going to be touching on things that I think are going to be pertinently relevant for every one of us. Forgiveness. To do that, I want to, want to talk about an encounter that, that the Apostle Peter had with Jesus that rocked his world. And I hope that what we share rocks your world in a good way. It's based on Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, that is Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Now that's a pretty big gesture, I would have thought. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And I, I love the way Jesus makes a point. He tells a story. And here's his story. There was a king who wished to settle accounts and when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I just point out, that's a ridiculous amount of money. That is a, literally, a, in that day, a national debt. That's not a personal debt. That's the equivalent of a national debt. A, a talent, you might, just, just to put it in perspective, a talent is 25 kilos of gold do the maths on that Gordon have you calculated that already an ounce of gold at 1750 US dollars an ounce right now translate that into metric and we end up with a lot of money thank you Gordon a lot of it's it's a huge huge amount how many ounces in a kilo my goodness me this is mind-bogglingly big and I think this is the point Jesus is making so if you're thinking $10,000, ah, I've got a credit card that, ex that nearly extends out to that. Don't think credit card. Think national debt. This is huge. 
Unbelievable. And since he could not pay, (laughs) his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Hmm, that I'd like to see. But anyway, and out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii was a day's wage. Or a denarius, denarii being plural. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So I hope you can, you can see the picture here. We've got uh, three, nearly two and a half months of salary compared to a national debt that's just been forgiven. Hmm. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Oh, I've heard those words before about three verses back right he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt when his fellow servants saw what had taken place they were greatly distressed and they went out and reported to their master all that had taken place then his master summoned him and said to him you wicked servant I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not you have had pity on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Does does anyone miss the point? Can we see what Jesus is saying here? And this is the big underlying point that I'm going to make throughout these next four sessions. This man owed, and I've had two people sitting in front of me right now text me the dollar amount, so thank you to those people who weren't listening but they were googling (laughs) but it is in the billions thank you I told you it's a national debt and here's the point I have heard people say before you can ask God for forgiveness you have to learn to forgive yourself and I'm going to say that is one of the most spiritually unhelpful statements you'll ever hear in your life. The only one who can forgive someone is the one who has been offended. If you put yourself in that position and make statements like that, you are declaring yourself to be God. Can you see why it's spiritually unhelpful? Can you see the point of what Jesus is saying here? Why should this man who owed some billions of dollars, thank you Michael, why why was he expected to forgive someone who owed him a few thousand dollars? Because his great debt had been cancelled. And because of that figure and it's it's clear the picture here isn't it the king represents god god's our debt toward him is measured in spiritual dollars in the trillions of dollars of debt and god forgives it because of christ who pays it actually for each one of us and here the whole point is once you've experienced god's forgiveness you are in a position where you now are able to forgive those who hurt, wound, offend, disappoint you. This is what happens when we forgive. Because forgiveness, this is, if you please, 
take this away today at least. When you don't forgive, you are, doing, you are not doing something wrong. When you don't forgive, you are not doing something wrong. And the reason is this. Please, there's a comma after that, so don't go away and say, oh, we don't have to forgive. No, no, no. Listen up. Keep tracking with me. When you have a sense of unforgiveness, which we have all had, what is happening there is a sense of justice. You have been wronged, that is wrong. You have a sense of justice that says that person has wronged me, they should suffer for the wrong they've caused me. That is justice. And we all have an innate sense of justice. But when you forgive, as Christ commands us to do, you Surrender your right to take revenge on the person who's hurt you, wounded you, disappointed you, offended you. You surrender that right. This does something. When you forgive someone, you release that person who has hurt you or wronged you from being indebted to you. When you forgive someone, here's the third thing that happens. You detox your soul's bitterness. Unforgiveness involuntarily leads to bitterness toward others. You can't help it. It will. You've heard it said, that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the person who has hurt you to die as a result when in fact you're the one who drank it. And the Bible describes bitterness as being a root that gets into your soul and it begins to fester and it poisons you. And when I say you, note that one finger, there's three pointing back at me. So we're all preaching to ourselves today Because this, as I said, affects all of us, every one of us. And here's how you, believer in Christ, follower of Christ, child of God, are able to forgive. Because God has forgiven you. And whatever offence you have been hurt by, Our offence toward God is multiplied over a billion times. And that's the point of the story Jesus told Peter. And when you've been forgiven that great amount, forgiving people for hurt, betrayal, slander, is a lot easier. The Bible says this. This is Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. This is what it's like as a Christian. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now, this is what forgiveness doesn't do. And this is really important to understand because I've heard people say things connecting God's forgiveness for the consequences that happen still happen when you are forgiven it doesn't undo all the consequences let me give you an example you may have in anger murdered someone please don't do that but you may have and you can ask God for forgiveness and God can forgive you 
but that person's still dead. It doesn't undo the consequences. Let's bring it down one step lower. You may have, and this is not the place where believers should frequent, but you may have got into the nightclub lifestyle and done something foolish as a result. Like as a young lady, you may have got drunk, that's bad. The headache might be a consequence, but the pregnancy might be a bigger one. And you can be forgiven. But the consequence of that night of irresponsibility is still going to be there. Let's dial it down one more step. You may have in anger said to your spouse, you idiot. When you settle accounts, when you've calmed down and you say something which we will be dealing with how to apologise, so excuse me while I don't do it right in this example, and you say, I'm sorry, you know there's still a consequence? There's still a consequence to hurting someone whom you took a vow to love with all your heart and that consequence is still there. It doesn't undo all the consequences. Secondly, it doesn't instantly restore trust. And this is what I need you to hear. Marriage. The spouse who breaks their marriage vows and commits unfaithfulness Please don't do that. But the spouse who does that and then confesses to their spouse this is what they've done may be forgiven. But they won't be trusted for a long time. That trust has been shattered. And I have walked with couples through these moments where one of them said, I don't understand it. I confessed. I asked for forgiveness. I've been forgiven. But they still won't trust me. And I'm looking, I I give them a look at, yes, and what's your question? Why are you surprised at this? That should be a warning to anyone who's not yet married. That if you're going to get married, you take those vows seriously. It doesn't instantly restore trust. Would you please stand? You see, sometimes we do things and we think, how on earth am I going to get out of this? How on earth can any good come from this? How? And as we go through this and as I share with you these principles of how to be forgiven, how to forgive, how to receive forgiveness, how to transact redemption, I trust that it will set you free. But there is a big one and it's in the story that Jesus told Peter. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But I need you to be confident in knowing this that we can come to God and ask Him to forgive our billions of dollars of spiritual debt and because of what Christ has done for us He will He makes a way we're going to sing that song to remind ourselves and then I'm coming back when Christ commissioned the Apostle Paul This is what he said to him. I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive, note this, forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Here's the point. 
we as followers of Christ are charged and commissioned to do something very similar to this, to help people to experience the forgiveness of sin. And I, I want us to understand that's not a moment. It's our life. Because when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And here the Apostle Paul was told that his commission was to turn people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So I'm just going to point out there is absolutely nowhere in the New Testament is it taught that you have to forgive yourself. It's irrelevant because once you've experienced the forgiveness of God, everything begins to take shape everything and this is what I hope we understand that we all need to walk in this God's forgiveness and you've heard me say no matter what you've done no matter who you've done it with no matter who knows what you've done no matter what the context or the circumstances, God offers you forgiveness. And that should cause us to respond like some of the people who responded to that exact same message to Jesus. They wept. They fell down. They kissed his feet. <laughs> Because they could not believe the offer, but the truth of it flooded their soul. No matter what you've done, no matter who knows what you've done, no matter what it is, God can forgive you. I want to close with a prayer that I want to teach you. And I'm going to be using this prayer throughout this series. And I will, as we go through this series, explain why. Sometimes we, we, we offer people what we call a sinner's prayer. In one sense, we're all sinners saved by grace. But it's not our identity. But hear this prayer. Father God, I regret my sins against you. Please forgive me. Help me from this point to live for you and to grow in my knowledge of you and to share your love with others. Fill me with your spirit. Amen. You can actually make that your prayer. And if you've never prayed that prayer, this could be the start of a whole new journey for you. But if you are a believer who doesn't believe that God can forgive you, you are calling God a liar. And I'm asking you, stop. Don't do that. God offers to forgive you because of what Jesus Christ has done. Would you please stand? Now I'm going to close in prayer. Having given you this prayer to make your own, a prayer that can start a whole new trajectory of your life. And you may, you may be saying, but you don't know what I've done. And that's true. I don't, and I don't need to know either. But I know this, no matter what you've done, no matter who you've done it with, no matter who you've done it to, no matter who knows about it or who doesn't know about it, it doesn't matter. God knows. And he is offering to forgive you right now. So Father, I pray that we would experience your forgiveness. And for those for whom maybe the money's never dropped all the way down into the parking meter, where it's never quite clicked that they've been forgiven by God, I pray in this moment that bondages would be broken, bitterness would be removed from people's souls, that the, the rehearsal of the pain, the rehearsal of the hurt, the rehearsal of the disappointment from this moment would stop because they release that person from that debt to them because you have released us from our debt to you. And so, Father, I pray that we would, as it says in Colossians 3.13, bear with one another, forgiving one another, 
and loving one another despite what the other has done. So now, Father, I pray that we would know you are the way maker. You really are the one who can put Humpty Dumpty back together and you're the one who can restore our soul, restore our life and offer us healing and forgiveness. Now may we know the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. God bless you.